Hey, quick reminder, if you like the stuff I'm doing, then you can get a bunch of exclusive videos over on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Thank you so much for your support, and now on with the show. I suspect that every game of the year list is going to open with some variation of wow, wasn't 2023 one of the best years for video games ever? Placing it in the canon of great video game years like 1998. But even aside from the twist a lot of people will put on that sentiment, stating that it was a great year for games but a bad year for the people who made them. And to be clear, it was legitimately horrible witnessing the near constant stream of layoffs from developers and media media alike, businesses and outlets big and small, livelihoods ruined with not but an email and best of luck in your future endeavours, within what is still a massively profitable multi-billion dollar business, all because of mismanagement? Monopolies resulting from inexplicably celebrated corporate mergers? The angle of the line going up not being quite as steep as some ridiculously myopic suits would have preferred, setting the industry up for massive Massive long-term pain in pursuit of the shortest of term gains. Even putting all that to the side, personally, I'm not sure I agree with the sentiment that 2023 was somehow the best year for games, or even particularly close, honestly. There were a lot of games, sure, with the dam finally bursting on all of those titles delayed by the events and subsequent hasty business shifts of 2020, but man, when I look at the admittedly gigantic list of games I checked out this year, there was indeed a long while where I struggled to envision a list of five games I felt passionate enough about to make an entire video on. And sorry if this seems like a negative note to start on, because I will absolutely become more positive. Don't get me wrong, this has been a great year for the channel at least. I finally hit 200,000 subs, which is neat I guess, and I have played a lot of amazing games. It's just that a great deal of them weren't from this year. In fact, the sheer amount of games releasing at any one time, and the long waning feeling that I need to play as much as possible for potential videos, or just to analyse industry or design trends and the like, all contributed to a period of time where it felt like games were viewed less as pieces of art for people to spend time with and really dig into, and more somewhat disposable content to consume and then unceremoniously chuck away for the next thing in the line. I actually made a video on this very phenomenon, a half hour deep dive into what it felt like to try and beat Tears of the Kingdom, while also wanting to talk about Street Fighter 6, VI, Final Fantasy 16, We Love Katamari, all of it. You can see it on my Patreon. And thanks for indulging me on that little plug, your support keeps this channel going and it really means the world. So yeah, it was certainly an interesting year for games, but clearly not one that did for me what it did for others. That said, I think those interesting years often generate the most varied and compelling lists, where maybe the types of games that appear or the order they appear in aren't quite what you expect. And hey, I like to think that's why a lot of you come to my personal list in particular. Also, as always, a number of these games I'm about to go into are on their way to becoming all-time favourites. So with all of that in mind, I think it's high time we dove into the Writing on Games Top 5 Games of 2023 that I played, obviously, and also this list is based purely on personal opinion, and if your list is different that's absolutely fine, with some honourable mentions thrown in for good measure. And kicking things off at number 5, we have Like a Dragon Gaiden, The Man Who Erased His Name. So if you want a comprehensive breakdown of my thoughts on this title, I recently uploaded a full video that delves into the game, which I'd recommend you check out after this one. That said, I could probably sum up my thoughts on this so-called side game in this beloved long-running franchise as complicated, namely in the sense that it follows a structural path set out previously, with the 10-15 to 15 hour story falling more in line with last year's excellent Kaito files than your typical Yakuza or Like a Dragon behemoth, and yet it arguably fails to live up to the potential in that more bite-sized approach. See, where last year's expansion to Lost Judgment saw the Kaito files trim away a lot of the narrative cruft that can sometimes bog these games down, the man who erased his name still finds itself mired in all too familiar political minutia, centering around characters that now have little time to convincingly break out of their deeply unlikely 
unbreakable shells. It's an issue of pacing, worsened by the fact that the game requires you to stop at multiple points and take part in a bunch of side content as part of the Sotenbori network. Of course, side content and sub-stories are a key component of this series, but in so segmenting the bits where you must do side content and the bits where you must do story only serves to halt the momentum of both, and the separate B-plot it's all attached to feels all the more disjointed as a result. But the thing is, I still really liked this game. Not only does it still represent a fairly hefty chunk of Like a Dragon stuff to get lost in if you're seeking that out, not only does its combat system see the most fully fleshed out moveset our hero has yet had at his disposal, but what this story represents for Kiryu manages to transcend the broader problems with its plot, at least in the end. See, as a reflection on identity, RGG Studio kind of knocked it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. Set between Yakuza's 6 and 7, we are met with a Kiryu refused his supposed swan song, instead forced into hiding, his identity as the dragon of Dojima fully erased. Japan itself is looking at a future where organised crime is forced off the streets, with several parties gearing up to dismantle the main families, and with those few hanging on, thrashing desperately to bring the world of the Yakuza back to its former romanticised glory. The streets may appear safer, but the crime didn't go away, it was just concentrated and condensed into the corners of society where people might not see it, eventually reaching a kind of critical mass as the denizens of this seedy underbelly yearn for the freedom they once felt like they had. And in the middle of all of this, we find Kiryu or Joryu thoroughly ground down, at a level of desperation, of existential meaninglessness that leaves him a shell of his former heroic self, struggling to find purpose, a reason to continue in amongst all this noise. And it makes for some of the most compelling, introspective moments we've gotten out of this character in a long time. Importantly though, in my opinion, this portrayal reflects a similar anxiety you can feel permeating the games of RGG Studio for the last several years, with 6 meant to be the jumping off point that allowed them to try other things that ended up coming across as a bit of a cop out, as even in their wildest experiments since, they seem to just keep coming back to tread that familiar ground over and over again. That is until you realise that with a gangland drama series and a gritty noir inspired detective series and a turn based RPG series under their belts, and as exemplified by an absolute powerhouse of an ending, possibly the best in the entire series, Like a Dragon Gaiden sees RGG Studio confidently state that they are finally ready to move on from Kiryu as the face of this franchise, their identity as a truly innovative force of storytelling firmly established. Not necessarily the best yak as a game game ever, but certainly one of the most important. And in at number 4 we have Baldur's Gate 3. I feel like Baldur's Gate 3 is, in many ways, the ideal of what a video game should be. In its dedication to bringing the Dungeons & Dragons experience to your keyboard or controller in as comprehensive a manner as possible, the developers at Larian have essentially created one of the most flexible, responsive engines for pure player expression and gameplay driven storytelling in the entire history of games. You know, there's a reason I spent about 30 or 40 hours just in Act 1 alone. Don't get me wrong, it is still a video game, a program piece of software filled with scripted dialogue, and as such, there are still limits to how far you will be able to push it, but it remains consistently, genuinely astounding the extent to which you can bend things to your will in Baldur's Gate 3. The kinds of scenario that in any other game would have you feel like you are being forced down a specific path can, in my experience, always be subverted if you just think laterally enough. And what's more, the game will almost always have a detailed, compelling response to that decision making. As if Larian Studios beat you to the punch like they do every time, but are gracious enough to let you feel as if you are some master strategist, outsmarting the inevitability of the systems in front of you. It really is one of those games that I stand in awe of, 
as if staring at a chapel so grand, so multifaceted in its construction, that you'd struggle to even envision the individual bricks being laid. And yet, it's number four on this list. Not that being my fourth favourite game of the year is any bad thing, to be clear, but given the terms in which I've been speaking about it, you might expect it to be higher. I guess it's just a similar case to Elden Ring last year, with Baldur's Gate 3 similarly being a game whose majesty I can obviously appreciate, whose world and story, and crucially my experience of them, have allowed me to see and do things that few other games could come close to that nonetheless I kind of drifted away from after a while. I mean, look, I'm not a big high fantasy guy to begin with, and as much as I think that Baldur's Gate 3 might have one of the most comprehensive combat systems of any turn-based game, it's still an admirably accurate representation of D&D combat, my least favourite aspect of that particular role-playing experience, and a system that, while it has its own potential for emergent, player-driven narrative, always felt like a frustrating distraction from the character development development I actually wanted to engage with. I long since turned the difficulty down to easy purely as a means of alleviating some of the associated tedium, something I'd highly recommend if you are one of the few weirdos like me that finds almost zero joy in turn-based combat. But even with that in mind, I feel like in Baldur's Gate 3's writing, scope and attention to detail, I found an experience with the kind of substance that it would take several regular games to match, and I'm not even finished it. From what other people say, I have so much more ahead of me, and there's a part of me that's kind of glad I have this massive piece of art that will spiritually sustain me well into the new year. In an industry that seems to demand you constantly pick up something new and throw the old away, it's definitely nice knowing that Baldur's Gate 3 will probably always just be there, especially in a year dominated by corporate mergers and other such ridiculousness and the associated slop being shoveled into the open mouths of audiences. The fact that a CRPG produced like Baldur's Gate 3, as deep and as flexible and as trusting in its players as Baldur's Baldur's Gate 3 can so dominate the cultural zeitgeist is something that should give us all hope in this otherwise dire media landscape. And in at number 3 we have Alan Wake 2. Alan Wake 2 truly is an anomaly, its very existence raising as many unanswerable questions as much as it makes total sense. You know, it feels like everything Remedy has been working towards for the past two decades or so, with their growing postmodern narrative ambitions finally meeting a gameplay framework that not only accompanies those ambitions with a solid mechanical experience, but is also grand enough to accommodate such Vision. On the other hand, with every disparate element that Alan Wake 2 is pulling together in terms of narrative universes and influences and different forms of storytelling media and the like, the fact that they were able to take such a vision and realise it at the scale that Alan Wake 2 requires as a sequel to a cult hit that even many diehard fans admit didn't play very well is kind of a miracle unto itself. It just seems like so many different things need to happen all at once for Alan Wake 2 to exist. Like the labyrinthine flexibility of Baldur's Gate 3 boggles my mind as to how every possibility was envisioned and prepared for in its production, I have not a clue as to how something of this scope was written, communicated to a team, planned, pitched and cobbled together. And the fact that Remedy just does it with an air of cool effortlessness as if it was the only thing they could have ever done makes this feat all the more impressive. Because there really is a synergy to the way everything works here that really allows Alan Wake 2 to capitalise on the potential of its predecessor in a way that that game never really managed. For one, to reiterate, it's the first Remedy game that I haven't actively disliked playing in a long time. A remarkable achievement given how its predecessor especially might feature some of the least enjoyable gameplay I've ever had the displeasure of enduring. But the thing is, it's not like things have seen a drastic upheaval here. The gameplay is still marred by a rather ineffectual set of firearms to choose from, inconsistent enemies and frequent camera issues 
issues, exacerbated by the framing of your character and the deliberate glitching of the world around you, leaving you wondering what the hell you're even shooting at a lot of the time. It certainly feels like an improvement upon its original, but on its own, it isn't great. But the way they fix things here isn't just by making the gunplay more enjoyable per se. They've just got way, way less of it this time around. No longer are you fighting off endless repetitive hordes. In fact, in my 18 or so hours of playtime, shockingly little of that time was dedicated to shooting at things at all. Most of the time you're just walking, talking to people, exploring the lovingly detailed environments. Dare I say, with how little immediate violence there is, Alan Wake 2 begins to take on the mechanical framework of a walking simulator, and I do not mean that in a derogatory manner. Important though, it just so happens that Alan Wake 2 is one of the scariest games I've played in years. Sure, you could argue that a lot of that comes from increasingly predictable jump scares, but for the most part, it's a case of the threat of combat constantly looming over you. In Alan's segments in particular, you're surrounded by these shadowy creatures bellowing at you, but staggeringly few will ever pose an actual threat. What Alan Wake 2 realises, however, despite its excess in other areas, when it comes to scares, you often just need one. You just need one shadow out of the hundreds you come across to leap out at you when you least suspect it, and suddenly your nerves are shot, trying to stay ahead of what might be totally imagined threats, kicking yourself for wasting a precious battery charge when you didn't need to. And after a while, you might start to feel a little jumpy, jittery, like you're losing grip on this version of reality a bit, looking for threats and patterns where there might not be any. And if there's a more appropriate mechanical framework with which to convey Alan Wake's, and to a lesser extent the more self-assured Saga's mindset, I don't know what it is. Both characters are regular people at odds with the way their respective worlds are working, whose very foundation is collapsing around our characters. In Saga's world, it's the impossible architecture, the physical properties of brick and steel and space being compromised, failing to work in exactly the way her memory seems to be failing her. Alan, on the other hand, is experiencing something altogether more tumultuous. For him, the very medium he exists within is challenged. He himself is no longer a person, but an artistic tool. Indeed, part of his horror is that, as explored in a great interview conducted by Gene Park with Remedy head Sam Lake, one of the author's key character flaws is that he is limiting himself, attempting to view his world in terms of hard and fast genre rules, when genre is the least of his issues. You know, Alan's trying to almost literally map his environment in terms of literature when his more overtly flesh and blood self is in a TV chat show studio in the midst of a musical number. And if that last game saw Alan Alan's writerly abilities extend little further than the next wave of enemies attacked me, then the next wave of enemies attacked me, then his years long stint in the dark place is testing his competency way beyond what he is likely capable of. Alan is tasked with writing himself out of his predicament, and he's arguably not a good enough writer to do so. Ironic, perhaps, given the obvious real-world skill required by Remedy to envision and render such a complicated scenario in the first place. And it's the fact that all of this can coexist, that we can experience it all mechanically, the densely textured environments and the equally dense experiences within, the outrageously camp, the thrillingly mysterious, the not anxiously tense and macabre, as well as the fact it can all so effectively convey the thoughts and feelings and failings of our characters at the same time, it all means that this is not just the potential of Alan Wake fully realised, it's arguably the pinnacle of Remedy's creative work to this point the convergence point of all the ideas they've been throwing around for decades now. Of course, this is far from gaming's first stint with what you might call postmodernism. We've seen plenty of games mess with space and time and form in similarly metatextual ways before this. But in that regard, Alan Wake 2 represents easily one of the biggest swings from an ostensibly AAA studio, or at the very least such overtly AAA production values, since the old 
old Metal Gear Solid games. You could look at Alan Wake 1 and see the very obvious literary and cinematic influences it was shooting for. Its sequel shares a number of those visual signifiers, but through sheer force of will manages to transcend them, becoming something wholly its own. I don't know, I guess I just adore and cherish the fact that in an industry that can often seem so creatively stagnant at the top levels, one where corporate interest appears to trump any kind of ambition or even humanity, that a game like Alan Wake 2 can not only exist, but can thrive and truly resonate with audiences, as proudly weird and dedicated to its wholly singular vision as it is. It'd be naive of me to say that this is the game big studios will look to for years to come as they attempt their own outside the box adventures, but hey, one can hope. And in at number two, my runner up for game of the year is Humanity. Humanity is one of the few games this year where I really kicked myself for not giving it more time. Having put a couple of hours into it around launch and necessarily drifting away from it consistently failing to schedule in the hours necessary to really consider it for this list. I was fully ready to write it off as just another game of the year casualty. The realities of this job meaning I can't feasibly get around to everything I want to check out in detail. That is, until my podcast co-host Nico and I started recording our multi-day collaborative deliberations for our own Game of the Year list. And more so than anything else, the consistent appearance and subsequent rejection of humanity for many categories, simply because I hadn't played enough of it, really started to gnaw at me. Our best looking category had me considering the lasting impact its stark minimalism had on me in a year of games that all blurred together otherwise. And god, the best music category was basically made for humanity, with its soundtrack masterfully bridging that gap between the game's visuals and its themes through gradually building vocal loops, as well as just serving as a fantastic ambient electronica album in its own right. Seriously, there are tracks on here that wouldn't feel out of place on an Aphex Twin or Boards of Canada album. And of course, biggest surprise really got to me because even from the couple of hours I'd played, I could tell there was nothing in 2023 that was quite like humanity. In isolation, every aspect of this game's design could see me gush about its individual beauty, but further, it all just made me want to play the damn game some more, to experience these disparate elements in the totality with which they were intended. One of the big regrets of the year for sure. And so, I just had to play more of it. Even with the daunting amount of video work I had before me, I decided to carve out a chunk of time to really dedicate to humanity. And boy did humanity deserve that time. This is a game whose fundamentals are engaging enough in themselves, but that manages to seamlessly shapeshift in such thoughtful, meaningful ways that the resultant journey this game took me on won't be one I soon forget. Because yes, you could boil humanity down to a puzzle game and leave it at that. In a year with many good to great puzzle titles, humanity is hands down my favourite. It's just that to do so, in my eyes, is to miss out a great chunk of what humanity truly is. Certainly, its puzzles vary wildly from careful, measured brain teasers where you spend forever mapping out a potential route in your head, ponderously stroking your metaphorical beard as you sit and watch a pile of human lemmings hurl themselves into the endless abyss below. And then it shifts in an instant to those more frenzied encounters that see you navigating things by the seat of your pants, trying desperately to guess what to do in the moment, and physically maneuver your way around that space before the ever-precious goldies required for progression and bonuses decide they want to join their walking partners in hurtling to their unceremonious doom. You know, despite the game's minimalist look, that ability to physically freely move around the space renders these environments delightfully tactile. The hordes you're trying to wrangle feel hefty in their unstoppable march. There's a physicality to humanity that goes beyond most puzzle games of this type, with its simple but absurdly clever design requiring no less of you in a cerebral sense. 
out. There are puzzles here that I was staring at for minutes at a time before I felt confident making any move at all, and stumbling upon that solution that was often staring me right in the face, combined with the ability to experiment on the fly in real time, is never anything less than deeply satisfying. It's just that that simplicity allows the team to experiment with new powers, doled out gradually over its surprisingly chunky runtime, that begin to merge in ways that drastically alter the very genre of game you're working with. That is to say, what starts off as a fairly obvious homage to Lemmings, later could see players feasibly compare humanity to Metal Gear Solid. Without spoiling anything, the game you end up beating is almost unrecognisable from the game you initially boot up in the best possible way. What's really fascinating about this though, and what I never expected going into it, was just how deeply this gameplay shift would tie into the narrative of the whole experience. Humanity's development involved collaboration between a number of different people and teams, including veteran game producer Tetsuya Mizuguchi, whose games I've never really associated with particularly fleshed out plots or direct delivery of story. His puzzle games, as intriguing and enjoyable as they often are, seem more concerned with developing and conveying atmosphere as a means of connecting with players. I know people who have cried at Tetris Effect for example, and while it is the best Tetris game ever made in my humble opinion, and I get why people might experience such profound emotional, spiritual reactions to it, it's often hard to definitively pinpoint why, other than it's just vibes man, meticulously crafted vibes, but vibes nonetheless. In humanity though, things go a bit further than that, with the streams of little cartoon humanoid creatures parading through these environments and off of ledges, and you playing as a little stylized sheep by you knew, there's initially a kind of light-hearted playfulness permeating humanity's world and tone, and what's more, there exists beauty in these colourful, arcing shapes and flowing rivers of people illuminating that otherwise grey, abyssal void. The kind of thing you could read as the beauty humanity as a whole can achieve when we come together as one. That is, until you remember that these doofuses are ready to walk off a cliff led away from certain doom only by a wee dug. The bleakness of such a scenario, however humorous, not lost on the people who made it. See, there's a really excellent documentary about the game, found on the Game Informer YouTube channel, that I cannot recommend highly enough. I think it only has about 6,000 views at the time of writing, which is criminally low given the quality, where Mitsuguchi himself talks about his push to provide a story that lives up to the profundity of the game's title, a sentiment that balances out against the will of his collaborators to present an image of humanity not as good or bad, but to merely illustrate how humanity is, a species yearning for a purpose, clamouring for safety and security in a world of un known threats, dangers real or imagined, finding security in packs but losing themselves in the process, going with the flow even if those at the front are leading them into further danger. There is indeed humour in the way that Humanity the Game presents this lemmings-esque image of Humanity the Species for sure, but beyond its visually dazzling cutscenes, the way the game starts to shift as new powers are introduced and puzzles become these tense exercises in tactical combat, as much as fun brain teasers, all leads to this scenario where progression can feel like you're fighting a hopeless battle against forces you can't understand, but who claim to understand everything about you. Similar to the economy of its visual design, there's a minimalism to the storytelling that doesn't bombard players with specific details about conflict or strife, but merely points these out as seeming inevitabilities of our species, that feel all the more pointless thanks to the sparseness of their presentation here. There's no deeper cause to the conflicts that begin to consume this world and the puzzles you partake in. It's merely a case of another party emerging, wanting something you want and the bloody sparks inevitably fly. And when you realise that you're feeling 
bad about pushing the gun button, feeling guilt for the faceless hordes slamming into each other and wiping people out, wondering if war and conflict is just a desperately sad, pointless inevitability for our species, all while finding some small solace in the fact that you keep striving for the safety and security of these unknown people in the face of such cosmic absurdity, you realise that humanity is using its simplicity to do things to convey ideas through mechanics that few others can do. Plus, to reiterate, it's just a damn good puzzle game in its own right. One of those titles that seem to get passed over in the constant assembly line of releases this year, so make sure this one doesn't slip under your radar. And before we get to our number one pick, it's time for some unranked honourable mentions. If you'd told me when I was 50, held 60 hours into Tears of the Kingdom, that it wouldn't have made the main list, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Such an incredible journey as it was through Hyrule once again, only this time majorly expanded both above and below. It just so happened that, as I detailed in a video on my Patreon about actively trying to beat the game, that last 30 hours or so represented such a comparatively tedious checklist that so went against the organic, freeform nature of the rest of my time with the game, it ended up shining such an unfortunate spotlight on all the minor problems with combat and weapon durability and the like that previously faded into the background of such an otherwise wondrous open world that it was downright miserable honestly. Still though, it's impossible to deny the genius at work in making all all these powers function in concert, in a manner that didn't just straight up break the game, and happened to run incredibly well on the Switch to boot. Ultimately a disappointment, but only in comparison to maybe the greatest open world game of all time. The Resident Evil 4 remake is a game so successful at what it does that I almost didn't enjoy playing it. So noxious was the tension in every single encounter as I was put in a terrifying level of control over how to proceed through each one of the many unpredictable hordes stampeding towards me. Unlike the RE2 remake, where I played through it countless times, that feeling that I don't want to put myself through this again is winning out in this case, but that's only because because the terror, so intrinsic to its frenetic action, is so carefully, deliberately dialed in. Final Fantasy XVI's overarching political machinations are dry enough that it made me miss the more grounded camaraderie of its predecessor's road trip, but I will say that Clive possessing an actual personality, bolstered by a legitimately great performance from Ben Starr, immediately puts him to the forefront of Final Fantasy player characters in terms of likeability, coupled with icon abilities that left me feeling a little breathless at the end of certain boss encounters, and this is a game I enjoyed way more than I expected to. The recently released remaster of We Love Katamari is such a densely layered experience, on one level providing everything you've come to love about Keita Takahashi's seminal series, only heightened more, bigger challenges that begin to spiral in scope way more quickly than in its predecessor, Damashi. A more fleshed out story that brings in more of that typical Keita Takahashi sadness to counteract the delightfully colourful exterior, and yet, on another level, said story also manages to weave in a more metatextual element poking fun at those fans who just want more, 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 only to still find ways to pick it all apart. The creator seemingly having to come to terms with the fact that he cannot please everyone. Well, if nothing else, Keita Takahashi, consider this player well and truly pleased. Chance of Sinar is a game I don't want to show too much of or say too much about for fear of ruining anything about it for potential players, so I'll just leave it at linguistic puzzle game, tell you it's as cool as that concept sounds, and to go play it, and leave it at that. When I was playing Jusson, it struck me as odd that there aren't more climbing games. Not just games with climbing in them, certainly not ones where climbing is treated essentially as a loading screen between different areas, but where climbing is the central conceit and mechanic. Its goal feels as pure as a racing game, where go fast and finish first morphs into start at bottom and climb to top. And similarly to racing games, I found myself entering a flow state within Jusant's serene, if eerie environs, whose rhythm, while occasionally janky, was so often incredibly gratifying. More climbing games, please. 
And look, as a pretty fervent cyberpunk defender from the off, it wasn't so much a surprise to me that 2.0, including the Phantom Liberty expansion, turned out to be a good time for me. In fact, playing through the game again with that aforementioned update, the one thing I was shocked by was how little I felt had materially changed about the foundation of the game, other than major welcome polish, and yet how much I still loved going through all of it again. Phantom Liberty in particular doesn't feel like some massive step up from what came before, rather just what cyberpunk could have been at launch were it just given more time. That said, the way that story wraps up and the ways in which Phantom Liberty directly plays into that main game's conclusion now is certainly a more substantial alteration than you'd typically expect from a piece of DLC, allowing CD Projekt Red to take their place once again as top of the pile when it comes to producing meaningful expansion. And with all of that out of the way, it's time to announce that the Writing on Games Game of the Year for 2023 is Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon. If you've paid attention to the channel at all this year, chances are you saw this one coming. When I decided to check out the 1997 original on a whim at the start of the year, I had no idea that it would end up with me playing through almost every game in the series, nor that said series would go on to become a true all-time favourite. It legitimately became a bit of an obsession, with many of the year's early releases falling to the wayside. Indeed, discovering the bounty of riches that is the Armored Core series was one of the most joyous experiences I had in games all year, but this also put a whole lot of pressure on its then upcoming sequel, bringing the series back to the public consciousness after all this time, following From Software's shift from niche middle tier developer to one of the most well regarded teams the medium has yet seen. How would this shift to the spotlight alter their approach to this grand return, one that series fans have been waiting for for over a decade. Luckily, at least to me, these worries were unfounded. Armored Core 6 is more than able to live up to that pressure. It's honestly akin to the situation I faced a few years ago with the remake of Tony Hawk's 1 and 2, where prior to that game's release, I would have classed Pro Skater 3 as one of the three best games ever made. And look, it's not necessarily a position I disagree with now, but simultaneously, if I'm going to be reaching for a Tony Hawk's game to play nowadays, the 2020 remake is the one I'm picking. Similarly, if there's one thing that I learned going into the Armored Core series, it's that there really is no one definitive idea of what an Armored Core game really is, each generation shifting the formula in ways that leave them feeling almost unrecognisable to what came before. And as someone who dealt with hundreds of YouTube comments on the subject, trust me when I say that there really is no consensus as to what the fan favourite AC game is. I mean, in a similar vein, I go back and forth on what my favourite is on an almost daily basis. That said, when it comes to the game I play the most nowadays, the one I keep coming back to with alarming regularity, there really is only one answer. 6 represents what I might consider the ideal mechanical intersection of all the AC generations prior, providing the speed and fluidity of 4th gen, balanced out by the comparative heft of the 3 games and even bringing some of the tactical ambitions of the much maligned 5th gen to fruition, with the resurgence of verticality and multiple different approaches to certain missions. And look, I'm not usually as big on the actual details of Armored Core plots as I am the richness of their atmosphere, the coldness with which such brutal, inhumane tasks are unceremoniously bestowed upon you by the corporations that destroyed the world. That said, with Six's increased length relative to other entries, its moment to moment plot, its evolving drama featuring surprisingly nuanced characters, represented an evolution in the series' storytelling that reflected the game's visual overhaul. You know, the resplendent vistas and crimson sunsets you blast through mark a dramatic shift from the barren, dingy hellscapes of old, but are nonetheless still the product of complete and utter environmental devastation. Similarly, the story loses none of its deliberately distant ambiguity, while also allowing its characters time enough to truly develop that you can sense there's real humanity running under fires of Rubicon, in a way that wasn't so obvious in the more deeply nihilistic entries of old. 
I developed bonds with characters here. Narrative choices were legitimately difficult because they often saw me betray those bonds. Relationships that weren't possible when factions mainly boiled down to the worst corporation on earth or the other worst corporation on earth. And crucially, all of this culminates in one of the greatest action games I have ever played. One where I was actually disappointed to have reached the end of the final narrative playthrough because I knew there was nothing after it. And so I just did it all again. Its battles are so fast, so brutal, and yet so addictively balletic perhaps resulting in the one time a cinematic reveal trailer has actually reflected what it's like when your hands are on the controller. Bolstered by some of the best customization options in the series, there's an expressiveness to this combat that to me is extremely difficult to rival. For all that its background is decidedly apocalyptic, this is the kind of action that has me gazing at the screen starry eyed tapping into a childlike wonder that says this is what video games are meant to be. To play Armored Core 6 is to experience true joy. And all of that alone would be enough for AC6 to take the top spot on my list, but man, I feel like that doesn't do enough justice to how important this series became for me this year. Look, everyone knows the woes of YouTube by this point, I won't bore you with them in any great detail, but when seemingly everything about this platform demands you keep up with what's new and shiny and widely talked about, and that you churn out content accordingly to match the constant stream of new releases, a workflow that was really starting to wear on me, I have to say, to be able to take the time digging into and producing a feature length video on the goddamn Armored Core games, and to have that resonate with people the way it did, felt pretty damn special, dare I say inspiring. The connection I ended up developing with that series, and the response that video got, felt like a pretty clear condemnation of the kind of approach things like YouTube Studio try to bash into the brains of their creators. In short, the Armored Core series, including 6, got me to view my entire job differently, in a far more positive, motivating light, directly influencing the direction I'm going to be taking from here. In such an otherwise desperately awful year for the industry, and one whose games left me feeling more jaded than they did many others, that FromSoft, at the current peak of their popularity, could choose to go back to Armored Core and produce a game that in many ways represents the best of that series, even though it might not be what the majority of their fans were expecting, feels reflective of how important that series became for me this year. Even if you want to argue that I'm jaded, after 9 years of doing this almost, games like Armored Core 6 serve as a reminder that there is still abundant joy to be found in this medium, if you're willing to seek it out. Armored Core 6 is the best game of 2023 in my opinion, and it makes me so, so happy to be able to say that. But as always with these lists, it's not just the games of 2023 that were great, but the people. And with that in mind, here are some creators that I think are worth your time going into 2024. With YouTube seeming to look favourably upon longer and longer content, the ability to stick 12 hour analysis on something, and have people comment incessantly about the video length alone, I would have long maintained an appreciation for conciseness, and with an average video of theirs running about 5 to 10 minutes, video games are bad certainly falls into that camp. Just really charming, funny, well produced, and importantly thoughtful videos on game design that have no interest in taking up your entire day. Instead, getting in and out, wasting not a word. I really loved their video on Shadows of Doubt, check it out. Pixel a Day has been creating the kinds of videos that I want to get back to making myself. Examining ideas within art that are bigger than any individual game's quality or function. While her recent release, What Is The Games Industry Missing, serves as a fantastic thesis statement going into her channel, thoughtfully interrogating our industry's tendency to tell the same kinds of stories, as well as foreground the same kinds of people talking about them, I think a great example of her mindset in action is the video on undersea wildness, examining things like bias and human intrusion into the documentary process, using that as a springboard to ask questions about what it would take for games to be truly ecocentric. Fascinating stuff. 
Now look, I am certainly not egotistical enough to think that anyone needs my help, so to speak, when it comes to growing their channel, but Eurothug4000 especially. I mean, her channel just hit 100,000 subscribers, which is incredibly well deserved, but I thought I'd just express how much I've been enjoying her videos lately, and point you in the direction of them if you haven't heard of her before. While her more recent videos are incredible, deep diving games that might not get the attention otherwise, I still keep coming back to her video on Bayonetta as one of the best pieces of writing I've seen on that game, analysing it through the lens of Susan Sontag's Notes on Camp. If you want something more recent, her video on Siren serves as an incredibly well-produced, insightful documentary on a cult classic. Well worth your time. Now look, I know that shouting out something on GameSpot, one of the biggest gaming sites on the planet, might seem a bit weird, but on a site so large, you might end up missing some of the really creative work being done in amongst the necessary sea of trailers and news. And in that spirit, I think you should all check out a series called The Kurt Locker, hosted by the titular and infinitely charismatic Kurt Indovino. His videos are what I would describe as infectiously creative. Every second carrying the kind of flair and enthusiasm for the medium, bolstered by an appreciation for ambition, for the weird and wacky found within art generally, that it makes me want to go and make things, to partake in craft. To me, it reads like the logical evolution of the kinds of videos Danny O'Dwyer used to make for the site back in the day. Kurt's piece on Wanted Dead and the joy of the 6 out of 10 game seems like a good starting point. Enjoy, and hopefully the show returns soon. Lord knows I really need it. And finally, as always, you've just got to subscribe to Lamhoot. You've just got to. He's one of the few creators where an upload will get me to drop whatever it is I'm doing and dedicate the time necessary to really sink into one of his videos. Even after all this time, his videos just keep getting better, more ambitious somehow. He's had a couple in the last year or so get more attention, and rightfully so. But I won't rest until more people appreciate what might be the best creator in the entire game one of the all-time greats. You are seriously doing yourself a disservice if you are not subscribed to Lamhoot. And with that, thank you all so much for watching this video as well as any others I've put out over the year. You've given me your time and I do not take that lightly. Thank you all so much. A massive thanks as well to my patrons who you can see on screen and are all getting access to exclusive, fully produced videos that aren't available here. Your continued support is what allows me to keep going with the work I do on this channel and I seriously cannot express how grateful I am for that. You are all the best. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Mel Meek, Michael Tritt, Alex O'Sullivan, Rickety Cricket, Cameron Sinistros, Urban Cheese, Charles J. Liu, Alistair Dunn, Vitautis Catarsis, Dolly Bowman, Young Condor, David Carstens, Tom Webster, Dana Sikowskis, Jordan Midler, Christopher Faherty, Nicholas Villeneuve, Yogesh Jishbande, Joe Lanzone, Lea Chinello, Captain Knusprich, Dylan Robinson, Bryce Snyder, CPJ MLT Limited, David Bjork, Timothy Jones, Carl Christensen, Matthew Grover, Shardfire, Lynn Browning, Dallas Keane, Charlie Kimball, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you all so much for watching, have a safe, happy new year, and I will see you all in 2024.